Set Joe. Uh, one second. Yep. Okay, Joe. I, my video is not working, so I think I'm going to stay no video if that's okay. <laughs> that's okay with us. Um, it's being a little squirrely. All right. So um, let's see. Rich isn't here, and uh, so I'm going to be the Acting chair, and I'll call. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Uh, I don't know if it's more. everybody else or if it's just me. I, I certainly can. Because you're like halfway across the room, Jill, and I don't have. Let's see if that's better. Can you hear me now? Yep, I'm good. So, uh, call a meeting to order at uh, 7 11. And Jill, can you call the roll? Sure. Uh, Rich Townsend, absent. Ben England is here. Jill Gazzetti here. Kareem, not here. Nope. Uh, Krista, nope. not here. Hiron. He's here. Oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> See you there. Uh, Mike Collins here. here. Brittany Clark here. here. Janie Hunter. No, Janae. Okay. Okay. Um, we have the uh, approval of the uh, minutes of the meeting held November 15th. Does anybody have any comments or can we take a motion to accept? Ira makes a motion to accept. Anyone second? I'll second. That's what that looks like, Bernie. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that's unanimous. Public comment? Clark? Okay, no public comment. Nobody on the, uh, nobody on the web? No one uh, has raised their hand on Zoom. Okay, so public comment is uh, not applicable. Alkey's presentation, um, the Alkey's uh, Government Affairs Director, Esme Lombard, will make an introductory presentation. So do you want to sit over here so the other people can see you? Um, I, yeah, I don't have anything formal, but I, okay. I'm happy to, um, it's more conversational. I thought I'd make it a little bit more conversational. Um, sure. I think they can see it now. I can see it now. Tested the chair. Oh, there we go. All right. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank you for having me. It's been a while um, since I think the last time I appeared before um, this, now it's a commission. I think it was a committee. I think it was a technology committee uh, a number of years ago. We were in the middle of building out our fiber uh, network in the state. Um, so it's great to come and, and meet you and kind of reintroduce myself and the company uh, to this commission. Um, so now it's called the Utility Commission. Um, so a little bit about, I just wanted to let you know, I'm the Government Affairs Director for um, Altis Optimum for the state of Connecticut. Um, I work pretty extensively with um, Tucker Murphy and Tiger Man on any issues that arise uh, in the community regarding, um, you know, our, our cable internet services. Um, and any road work that we have to do, uh, you know, with your police and, and um, your Department of uh, Public Works. Um, we are, Altis USA is one of the largest broadband uh, communications and video service providers in the nation. We deliver broadband, video, uh, news, mobile, and advertising services to more than 9.9 .9 million uh, residential and business customers throughout 21 states. In Connecticut, we offer cable and telecommunications services 
to more than 423,000 homes and businesses throughout our Optima brand. Um, the company also offers hyperlocal news, national and international news through our News 12 and I-24 news, and we serve 24 communities throughout the state uh, in Fairfield, New Haven, and Litchfield County. Uh, we offer our gig product to our entire service territory throughout Connecticut, and we are offering fiber to the home network that enables multi-gigs multi -gigs metrical speed, say that fast 10 times, <laughs> to nearly 6,000 new Cayman residents. Um, so I really wanted to kind of keep this open, open-ended, uh, see if you had any questions, um, if there's, are there any, you know, if there's anything you want to discuss specifically, but, you know, I look forward to working with the, the new town leadership and uh, this commission on any issues that you all might have. We, we really want to be the connectivity provider of choice for, for the town of New Haven. Um, sure, I'll, I'll lead out and so, you know, I told you that I was interested in resiliency and we've had uh, uh, two outages in, in, the, uh, in the last year and, um, you know, it sort of uh, bothers me as, you know, an electronics and old time telecoms guy you know, that we built out the internet, you know, so that it would be um, redundant paths. Yeah. And yet we don't seem to have that. Um, how, how are we building out the optimum system um, for, the, uh, for the network infrastructure and switches to allow for um, redundant communication in case of fiber cuts? So I'm aware of one <laughs> uh, outage. Are you, what is the, I'm aware of, of one that happened last year uh, between um, in Norwalk? Yes. That one and that was a that was vandalism and a cut. But what was the what is the other one you're referring to? Russ, you want to chime in on the last one? Sorry, one second. You there? Here. We're on here. Yes, I am here. Uh, and that was actually no fault of Optimums. It was a fiber cut. However, uh, the, I think the question, SMA, and hello there, this is Russ. We, I think we've interfaced a couple times before, in particular with the uh, uh, March 24th, 2023 uh, outage. Um, to understand just what, what are your broad plans to make sure that we have redundancy within the system uh, and ensure that we have more than one fiber backhaul line, you know, uh, that services the town and critical infrastructure uh, between not only Optimum, uh, but also LightPath, so. So that was, that. I can, I, I'm going to have to get more detail for you on that, but I do know that our system does have redundancy built into it. And that, in the specific case of van, the vandalism, um, we were actually in the process of, of deploying our fiber network and there was, there, it, we had to do a shutdown in the middle of the night, which is very common when we have to, when we have to make a critical connection. Um, and that was a unique, that was a unique situation. Um, and we were not able to get restored in time for people to, when they were started to use the network um, back up and running. But I don't, I, that's the only one that I'm aware of that was, that was massive. Um, and um, we, do, we do build in uh, resiliency into our network. We also have, in the case of any outages, we bring in uh, generators to make sure our network stays up and running and deploy them at our critical hub sites and our critical facilities. Um, and on, on our HFC network, we have we have backup. Um, but so we do we do have resiliency built in. I don't know in that particular case, um, um, but it was unique because we were actually deploying and working on making some critical connections, critical connections. And, and I think one of the key questions, and without exposing anything that would potentially be. Um, uh, sensitive infrastructure, obviously, which we wouldn't want to do in public forum, but just ensuring that um, Optimum is not only our town, but in multiple municipalities, making sure that they have redundant fiber lay-ins uh, off not just one road, but multiple roads to service the community and the businesses. Uh, and I think that's just a question about as uh, Optimum in the last year has done a lot of work to uh, bring fiber residentially, uh, the question becomes those backhauls to the 
what can we partner with you to find ways to ensure that there is redundancy and multiple uh, main halls back through multiple switches, as Sven was saying, to ensure that uh, if there's one, there's no single point of failure. Absolutely. I think what would make sense is to get get on the phone with some, maybe uh, have a meeting and get on the phone with some of our emergency operations folks um, who I work with pretty extensively in times of emergencies. Um, the state convenes a task force um, when we need to, you know, when we have to deal with critical infrastructure and making sure it stays online. Um, but I think it'd be, it would make sense to put you in touch with the right people internally to, to have those conversations. And equally, uh, obviously, you're not regulated by Pura, so it's a very different situation than you and Eversource, but um, Eversource maintains a critical infrastructure list. So they are maintaining things such as, in their case, with power, wastewater treatment facilities, police, fire, EMS, those sorts of things. There is, as the world has progressed and there is a tremendous dependency on internet, in particular those backhauls for public safety communications and other things, one of the questions becomes maybe we should explore uh, identifying those facilities in advance so that when you know there's a service outage, you know to prioritize those because they are serving a, a key public need. Absolutely. And that's the work. We've done a lot of work on the ESF 12 task force to do that. We actually have provided, we participate in that, um, those meetings and have provided the state with a list of crit critical infrastructure. Um, along with the utilities. So we work uh, lockstep with them. And, and also, you know, our, our service outages, we, we rely on uh, the restoration of commercial power. Um, so we typically follow them um, in, in during times of outages, but absolutely we can. And if there's anything specific that you'd like us to really focus on, we're, we're happy to do that. That makes sense. And I, and I, I sit on the ESF2 uh, worker, which is communications. Um, very similar because communications is so reliant upon that internet backhaul. Um, I, look, I'm happy to help. Our, our, our region is happy to help with finding ways to improve that redundancy um, and identify those key points of failure and the critical infrastructure in particular, where we can identify that beforehand. And so you know it's just through your own internal processes that this oh this one is a critical situation and we need to address it quickly uh that's better for everyone absolutely because as far as you know based on experience now you know we know that there's no redundancy and we would like to, i think we'd like to talk to your emergency operations people understand you know that there is you know, a level of redundancy that we can rely on um we just can't afford to um you know lose you know large parts of town um to lose your service and we're, we're extremely concerned about that i think we would like to uh have Maybe not the location identified, but um, an overview of you know how many redundant paths and redundant switches can we rely on. Okay. Well, where there's a where there's say there's a hole or where there's at least we've identified or you know that you've identified where something that's not on can be addressed or is being addressed or will be addressed. Right. Path redundancy and switch redundancy. Okay. Was resiliency. Um, but just, just in general, I think it was probably with all the services that we get. The question I think that this that we're all curious about in terms of is there, you know, any any major project that's in the near, near term that will be, you know, either visible to the public or be, you know, almost inconvenient if it's necessary work, but where the public just needs to be aware. Is there are there? I'm not sure what if you know the plans or how we could get a sense of that or what the planning for that is. What are teams? I, I can't speak to that because I haven't, I didn't uh, connect with our uh, construction team before I came and I wasn't sure if, you know, what you, 100% what you wanted to hear. Yeah. So um, 
I can let you know what we typically do is work with uh, Tiger Man and the police department when we do have something coming up. We have a team that comes in, files for the permits, lets people know that we're going to be working in the area. We put, we tend to put door knockers on, or door hangers, excuse me, on homes uh, where we are going to be working if there's any street. Um, and we also try to stay away from busy places like schools and where there might be a lot of traffic and, and kind of keep our work um, minimized during kind of high traffic times in some of those areas, especially. Um, I think uh, I don't have any specific uh, project, you know, that I'm that I'm aware of right now uh, that we're doing. I know we've done extensive work in the last um, in 2023 um, in in this town. So, but happy to happy to connect with you in advance when we know when we're aware of projects and things coming in. And I'll add in on that. Just uh, I think it's incredibly important that advance notice because the world has changed. And I'll give, just give you a small example of that. Our public safety radio system is based on those internet backhauls, right? And it can be a diaspora of things. It can be a, a light path fiber. It can be something as simple as an optimum cable modem. Um, but outages can take out nodes of that system and we're able to adapt. We have backup systems, but advanced notice allows us to do that. For redundancy, the resiliency, we'll move on. Um, so I've got the questions that, that I sent you from, uh, from Ridge Townsend. Um, sorry. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so Rich says, these are uh, simply observations from several customers which were forwarded to him. Uh, given that Altice has wired the cane with fiber, why do customers have to force them to upgrade their service to fiber? Why don't they simply upgrade the customer as a benefit of Altice? So I don't, I don't think we're forcing anybody on. We're still we continue to invest in our, our HSC and FTTH networks, the fiber to the home networks, uh, to ensure that the customers on either network have access to high quality internet video and voice. Um, if a customer is interested in migrating to fiber, then all they have to do is pick up the phone and call. As of today, there are no installation fees to do this. Um, you know. I know I've talked to people about the benefits of both HSC as well as fiber over time. Some people are not prepared to jump into fiber. Some people say, do I need to switch? Do I need? But I mean, we of course want them to switch and you know want them to see all the benefits of fiber. Um, there's a few things I would encourage people to do. I encourage people to come into our stores if they wanna to talk to somebody in person, kind of get a feel for what the products are. And what the benefits of switching are, they can have a longer term, a longer conversation with someone in person. They also can give us a call. Um, but nobody's being, nobody is being <laughs> forced into it. <laughs> nobody's being strong armed into it. Um, I, think I think it was some, the other way around. You know, it says, why do customers have to force them to upgrade the service to fiber? Oh, well, we've been spending, yeah, we've been, like we've been spending years building our, we've been spending years uh, building out our network. And it's been, you know, it's been challenging, uh, especially because we started, I think, right during COVID. So that was, that was a big challenge. But I think that we, we cover over 6,000 customers in, in New Canaan. And yeah, if anybody wants the, fiber. Uh, fiber yeah, if anybody wants fiber, they should definitely call and sign up to get the get the emails to understand when it's available. Okay. Um, then comes the uh, hard question. The apparent optimum strategy for product and pricing to customers is as follows. Assure that product prices are changed through time to have the customer bills increase by 10 to 20% per year. Product packages are so complex the customer cannot understand and value what they are paying for. The way the customer, the way for the customer to address this 
is to call and threaten to cut the cable. The agent then insists on having a price reduction negotiation for the current offering. This will generally get a total price reduction of about 25%. The process must be repeated every couple of years. Why don't you simply keep the prices for all customers current for everyone? So pricing. <laughs> that's a that's, we can be here all night talking about yeah, pricing, yeah. but I, I think that's a challenging. We we offer a variety of, of products and services that I think are designed to meet customers' needs on a on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. um, programming costs have gone up, so cable rates have gone up. Um, I'm happy to report that broadband prices have come down. Um, but I, I think it's important to be able to talk to a customer and be able to make sure the customer gets the right products and services for what they need. I'm, I'm aware that um, people do have introductory offers and those introductory offers expire, but you know that's, that's the model we've been working with and we, we try to add new uh, products and services to our, to our offerings um, you know, as much as we can. And, um, you know, evolve to you know, meet the needs of the customers today. I know it's not always easy. Uh, you know, I'm here to talk about that more at length. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free. To, I'll make sure you all have my email and uh, phone number, and you know, you can reach out any time to discuss anything specific. And um, I certainly can escalate uh, things um, as well that need to be escalated. That will be posted in the uh, draft and the uh, and the final minutes for this meeting. So when you see it up on the web, you can go look at it. Um, I guess the real, you know, the one that you know really sticks out to me is um, the uh, the complexity of, of the uh, of the bills. Yeah. And uh, maybe they don't seem so transparent. And, is there work, you know, is, you know, instead of obfuscating, you know, what the billing is, you know, is there a way to make it more clear? Or can we just sit here and say that, you know, we find, you know, the, the bills to be obscure and uh, more difficult to understand, you know, as a person says, when we're taking multiple products from them. Yeah, I think it. I think it gets when a customer is able to bundle um, products and services, they certainly save. Um, and when you when you migrate those out, I think it it can it's a different offering. Um, I would I would encourage you to go to our website. We have we have actually we have a new um, a market structure. We have a new leadership team that's really done nothing but focus on the customer experience. And, um, you know, we've, rather, we've definitely weathered some rocky times, um, but um, we, have a, we have a chief executive of, of, of the customer experience, and Roy, um, it's Shu Roy, and he's, he's really, he's actually sent a letter to all the customers as well as the our- I can actually let me give you his name. His name's Shu Roy, and it's, I'm going to give you. He's he recently has sent an email to all of our um, uh, to all customers. Um, this is full screen, and um, really outlining all the changes that the company has gone through in responding to uh, the customer experience. Um, one of the things that customers can do is go in there in this email that's going to each customer. Um, there's there's FAQs. There's new resources on our website. Um, sorry, if I look look at this, oh, I can tell you what else. I want to make sure I get this right on all the different on all the different changes that have gone through our service appointment. Time. Jill, I'm going to email you the uh, after the meeting. I'm going to email you the gentleman's name and his office. It doesn't have his. Uh, email or phone on it, but anyway, it's something. That would be great, thanks. Yeah, I can, I can make sure. Um, we have more digital support, we have an enhanced FAQ, we have more chat support, and we also have improved uh, call center support. Um, but in, in each of those, the, on the FAQ, if you do go to the website, you 
are able to drill down on what does my bill look like? And I can, I'll make sure to get this link. What are the, what are the fees that go into this? What is the channel lineup? What are the services that I'm getting? So you can see all of that online and kind of drill, drill down into it further. Do you have so Jill's email? I don't, but I, I will get you Jill's email. Okay. Um, then the last question on this on this list is, what government agencies, federal, state, and town, can their regulations impact LTs and their competitors' operations in New Canaan? What is the impact of the New Canaan marketplace, and do you operate in a competitive market in New Canaan? So, what was the? I'm sorry. What was the first? What one? government agencies, federal, state, town? And their regulations impact LTs and their competitors' operations in New Canaan. I don't think we have any. I don't believe we have any town regulations beyond. Uh, well, when beyond we, opening a street. Right. When we do the road opening, we we do road opening for local uh, services, and then we have to work in the the public right away. Um, we also have to do uh, some. Yeah, we get the road opening permit. Um, we have regulatory requirements with, you know, with PURA, Public Utility Regulatory Authority, that we have to comply with as a, um, as a video, as a video provider. That's a state um, organization. As, that's a state, yeah. and then we also have the FCC. The federal, federal FCC. Yes. Yeah. Federal communications. And then there was a second part of that question. I'm sorry, I didn't. No, no regulations. No, we just covered it. Okay. What is the impact of the New Canaan marketplace? That's a big topic. I mean, the impact, I think what I can tell you is that the co competition has increased. Um, there have been new entrants and there's multiple, multiple ways to get broadband. So I think as over time, as you see new entrants in the marketplace, you'll see, you'll see changes in pricing or you'll see changes in offerings. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's, exciting <laughs> yeah we've had the uh, frontier uh, people uh, you know walk down the street and knock on all the doors yeah yeah just just to just to be clear I, I, just to make sure I'm, I'm my understanding is correct obviously you, there are safety you know when you talk about roads and regulations or guidelines that you follow uh, from the town um, this in what way does pure they don't regulate your rates um, they don't think they regulate your, 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 your but what they regulate your is, is there like the, like the billing for example is that is there any is there any oversight of the <coughs> that billing we have to file we have we have to file certain regulatory compliance notifications if and when we make any changes to line up channel line up um, pricing um, to the federal government no pure to pure to pure you file it you file it it's, it's more information for information, right? right. Just so they, what they see you're the rate card, right? They're able to see the changes in the rate card. They're able to but, see. But pricing is just a competitive. It's just competitive. It's, competitive. it's just competitive, right? Yeah, that's not that's what I meant. And then the the last question on, on uh, Rich's hit list is: um, Do you operate in a competitive open market in New Canaan? We do. We do. We absolutely do. There are, uh, if you're unhappy, there are other uh, alternatives. But, um, so all you folks uh, from the committee on uh, on the Zoom, any questions for Esme? Not really, I got a suggestion to, to go to one of the stores or uh, <clears throat> call the, the, the helpline is, is good. Because I think we hear about these these fiber optic cables running along the main streets, but people have, <clears throat> have questions about how do I get it into my house. Um, so I guess we'll use those resources to answer that question. And there, there's there's sort of a rollout of how you're doing it anyway to houses, right? It's not just when somebody asks, do you uh, do you have certain neighborhoods that you're working on first or there's been a methodology to it, um, I, and I know that I believe anybody in New Canaan that wants 
uh, fiber is able to get it. I don't, I'm not 100%, but there might be some areas that are a little bit more difficult to get to, but I, um, I really encourage people to sign up. There's a place you can go to sign up and, and um, put in your email address to be notified when it's available to you. So it makes it easy. Um, but you can also, if you're interested, call and, and check. There's also a, an availability check um, online. You can type in your address and see if it's available. Did you target residential, you know, single family homes first and then sort of apartments, condos or things like that secondary? I can't, I can't speak to that for, I'm sorry, I don't have that for this uh, meeting tonight, uh, but I can try to get you that information. Okay, thanks. Um, I do have one question. Um, I, I do have the fiber brought to my house in New Canaan, um, but it was a little bit of a procedure. How can you speak a little bit about um, the um, the the text that you're using to put them in? Are they are they all Altice, or do you use a lot of subcontractors? And how are are you outsourcing it, or is it all run by? So we have a mix. We have in-house employees as well as contractors that are used. Um, you know, when, just in the, similar to in times where there's an emergency where we need to bring in extra crews to help people, you know, for restoration, we, we have that capacity as well. We can kind of call in on teams and other places. Um, I can't speak to um, specific jobs that were done here, yeah. but I know we did use a mix of uh, in-house as well as outside uh, contractors and employees. Okay with that, Jill? Yeah, um, I guess my concern is the mod, a little bit of the monitoring of them. I had some issues with, you know, the communication getting from the contractor back to Altice, and so I, I don't know if you're the, you know, if you have much information on how that's monitored and 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 the subcontracting. Um, I'm happy to, Jill. I'm happy to escalate any issues you you have, and we can look into it. Um, you know, yeah. we, again, we can focus on making sure the customer experience is improved. Um, yeah. We have had challenges where, you know, we, uh, we've, you know, the communication did, didn't always go the way it should. And there were, you know, mm -hmm. visits, maybe multiple mm -hmm. visits, but I think we've got a, a strong, uh, you know, optimum market structure team that's in place now that's fully focused on that. And the, we've seen the improvements in all of those numbers, customer customer satisfaction and uh, service levels. Okay. Um, you know, it, so, you know, mine is specific, whatever I had, there was issues when it was coming in with, it took over six months to finally get it connected. And I kept having the subcontractors coming out, they couldn't fix it. And then they would, I would end up waiting a month and then having to call and nobody knew what had happened and it would start all over. So this has been a little while. I, I was just curious as to whether this has been, I don't know whether this is just an issue with me or a town, but how much of it's done by subcontractors and 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 the sort of monitoring of that process that you have and if the, how that's working. So. Um. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Valid concern. Um, I think we've, we've turned a corner on that. Okay. That's great. Mike, anything? No, I'm very satisfied. Okie doke. Russ, any last words? Uh, no, only to say thank you, Esme. Appreciate you know the the couple times I interacted with you with storms and everything else. I appreciate your responsiveness and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you for your partnership. Chief DeFrederico, anything? No, oh, sir, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for having me. We really me. appreciate you coming yeah. out on a nasty night. Yeah, it'll be an <laughs> adventure getting home. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you need help, you can come run back upstairs. I will, I will take you, I'll take you up on that if necessary. Good. Thank you very much. I hope, I look forward to this. I, I really look forward to this being an open dialogue, kind of a continued dialogue 
uh, with this, you know, commission and, and the, of course the town. Um, I'm just making sure that we, you know, solve any challenges together. And yeah. You got my email. Yeah. You yeah. Know, um, any of the links and stuff that you want, uh, uh, we'd like to put in the uh, minutes and uh, you send them to me, but I'll forward them on to Jill and we'll be all set. That sounds great. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. You. Enjoy your trip. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Take care. Uh, item five on the agenda is a drive-by test follow-on work. I um, was hoping to hear from uh, Krista and uh, Kareem, um, but uh, we're missing them tonight. So I think we'll take a pass on uh, item five. Um, I will just say that um, you know, we are in budget season. And uh, this will cost money. Um, we need to uh, talk with the um, uh, with the selectmen and make sure that we have going into board of finance this month that we have a uh, you know, a, a straw man number going forward, not only for the uh, drive by study, but for any other um, professional or expert services that we may need to bring to bear on this matter. Okay. So on that note though, how do how do we go forward since budget season is now and we don't have another meeting before the budget? I'm concerned with the that so we're gonna miss another we you know um have talked um Rich has talked with the uh with the selectman um we he's made a uh, made known to uh, Deanna and uh, Tucker what a uh, bogey number would be for the year. Okay. And um, so the selectman's response is that um, you know, rather than taking it um, from a, a contingency uh, number that we would budget it so that it, the money would be available on July 1, which means that we can, um, you know, get through contract so that uh, on July one we can um, expend the funds, you know, to uh, put the uh, the drive study in motion. It basically allow us hopefully to uh, book a slot and and equipment, uh, depending upon you know the vendor chosen. Is that semi clear as mud? <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's anything that we yeah. need to do, you know, before the next meeting to to kind of lock that in or or get information out to the selectmen. Well, we're gonna find out. Okay. We will. I will check, okay. and we will make sure because next month I'm gonna be here. Yeah, yeah, I'll be here right before I head to New Zealand. Okay. Do we have any rough budget numbers for that at this time, or is it still up in the air based upon the type of study we're looking at? Well, you know, you remember the the, uh, the budget number that uh, Rich was floating for UCLA was around twenty five thousand. Right. Okay. And, and we still think that might be a good number. And you know that and some other stuff. I think Rich is looking at a number that may be three times that. <laughs> okay. You know, if, if we don't if we don't spend it, you know, it's that's fine too. This is, this is not like, you know, it's not like we're running a department, you know, it's not like, you know, <clears throat> don't spend it, we won't get any money next year. So, so is that about it? We move on from five, any other comments? No. Okay. Number six is uh, talking about emergency uh, communications. So, um, we got a couple of things going on. Um, <clears throat> we got Russ, you know, who's our director of emergency management, office of emergency management, and we've got uh, Chief John D. Frederico on, and Andrew's not on tonight. Okay, Andrew Walsh. Um, so, uh, so the deal is, folks, that um, our nine one one dispatch comes out of the New Keenan Police Department. 
and they have all the equipment to do this. So what we have going forward is um, hearing from Russ, you know, about the experience with Skylink so far and talking to Chief Federico, you know, about the new capacity in 9-11 uh, dispatch. And particularly some of the stuff that people don't know is that dispatch apparently can handle texts. So I'm gonna kick it off and let Russ go first and then Chief Chief Federico. And um, you know, John, feel free to jump in, you know, if you want. You don't have to, you can talk over us. We're a small group tonight. So uh, yeah, so I uh, thank you, Sven, and thank you, commissioners. Uh, so I was asked to, I think when you first formed the commission or reformed the commission, there was a discussion about the Starlink, uh, which we had installed uh, on my fire chief vehicle and also mostly for emergency management uh, to have uh, much to the conversation we had tonight about internet, a backhaul that is not geographically dependent upon individual fiber lines running down a single road, something like that. Uh, and I think, Sven, you were interested to hear about how it's been working thus far. So uh, the answer is that uh, it works very well. Um, it's I, I've been actually very impressed with the, the technology that Starlink and obviously Elon Musk have created. Um, it is a single dish to refresh everyone as to what it is. It's a single dish. The, the hardware is $2,500. Uh, and the subscription is $250 a month for the, what they call one gigabyte priority first responder, which basically similar to FirstNet and some of the uh, First Verizon and AT&T, it, it punts other people off the net because you have a priority. Um, so I've had it for about six or seven months. And the reason that uh, emergency management acquired it was we wanted a single one in the town that if we have, I hate to say what happened with Optimum where it took out all of our phones uh, not the 911. I want to make that very clear. 911 is in a separate system, but our town phone system, voice over IP phones, went down. Uh, and we also had failures in our public safety radio system because they all run on the same uh, optimum Altice um, uh, light path uh, system that we wanted the ability to run our emergency operations center, so six to 10 computers and phones. Uh, and know that no matter what was going on around us, we could at least get that part of government running. Um, so six months in, it's worked. Uh, it's I've taken it to two responses with the Fairfield County Communications Hazardous Materials Response Team. Um, so I brought it out to, uh, we had a hazmat at um, Sacred Heart University. Uh, and this, cell, I don't know whether it was a combination of the cell service wasn't great or whether the cell towers were kind of getting overrun. Uh, and we were able to power internet for the communications vehicle. Um, best speeds I've seen have been in the 250 megabytes per second uh, rate, which is very impressive, provided you have a clear view of the sky. Uh, it is definitely affected by tree cover. So canopy, you need to have a pretty good clear uh, view of the sky. Uh, it is a phased array style uh, dish. Um, so if you lose 50% of your canopy because the satellites are constantly moving across, you'll lose 50% of your bandwidth. Um, but that said, uh, we also used it at one other call in the six months where we were able to get a, a cell phone call using wireless calling. So anyone who has any phone, um, AT&T, Verizon, whatever, as long as they can do cell over Wi-Fi, which is an option within your settings, it'll basically route the traffic when you can't get the cell tower through that backhaul. Uh, and for voice, it worked well. Um, so it's been good. I think the, the, the reality is, is that it doesn't replace the need for redundant cellular communications in town. Uh, because when you think of police, fire, and EMS, data is part of our life now, whether it's mobile data terminals, whether it's the communications on scene with cell phones, it's, you know, I think we've, we've talked a lot about this. Um, the reality is, is that, that, that the service currently uh, through Starlink is not economically feasible. Um, a single unit of $2,500 and $3,000 a subscription unit if you times that by six fire trucks and 14 police vehicles, you know, you're talking 70 or $80,000 a year in subscription fees. Now, our hope is uh, that over time that this cost will come down. And we've also seen, and I think that one of the questions you're gonna be talking about in a, a bit, Sven, is uh, about, is this going to be a means of alternate notification for 911? 
Uh, we just saw that SpaceX on Jan 8, uh, in partnership uh, with T-Mobile, started to actually have T-Mobile cell phones. They were able to send text messages, and it was a test. It's not in the public yet. I think they're still targeting 2025 for this. But uh, they were able to send very small packets of information, text messages back and forth. Um, so I think that the technology is on its way, but it's not there yet. Uh, a single unit makes perfect sense for the town for us to have if everything goes um, hair-shaped, I hate to say, in emergency management parlance, uh, that we have that one means to get out with internet uh, backhaul somewhere else in the country, uh, but it's not feasible currently on a fleet-wide basis. So if we have the mobile trailer and we have uh, your uh, vehicle and we've got clear canopy, so then do we what? Wi-Fi from the emergency trailer to your vehicle as a Wi-Fi hub and then out to the world? Yeah, so it, again, uh, you're you're running on the speeds 200, and 200 to 250 is the most I've seen, usually 150. Think of it as half of a cable modem in your house. Pretty good, but again, the download speed's far higher than the upload speed, but the, 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 the mechanics of it is the dish is removable, so you can put it in a parking lot, which was part of, part of my thought process. So you can remove it, take the car doesn't even need to be anywhere near it, take the equipment and throw it out in a parking lot and run a cat five cable inside to your switch and be able to run the equipment you need to run um, anywhere. As long as you have power and a somewhat clear view of the sky, you can either create a Wi-Fi hotspot or do a cat five cable to a switch and run multiple devices. Have we tried that with the command trailer? So we haven't tried it with the command trailer because I, I hate to say it, I think that the command trailer is on its last legs. Um, I think that we've yet to have the discussion as to whether we're going to keep that vehicle or not, because, um, I, you know, I obviously I was trying to get ARPA funds for that to be replaced. Um, we were asked to reassess that and see if we could find a, um, a, a more cost effective solution. And I think that the, the reality is right now, based on what we're looking at, a refurbished ambulance would not do a very good job. Uh, so what I've been doing is twofold. Uh, I, I personally joined the Fairfield County Communications team. Uh, they're the ones who have the uh, Field Com 1, they call it, uh, which is the large command center vehicle, which has um, SATCOM, radio, and everything else. Uh, and so it's on call. It's delayed response. And uh, I hate to say, well, we have pre-planned events. I'm calling. Uh, I put in for 4th of July on... Uh, I think the 10th of July to try to put our <laughs> our ticket in to get it. So the answer is the trailer is still there, but the reality of us calling it because of its condition, which is pretty much at end of it is at end of life, uh, we're probably going to end up calling mutual aid for Westport to respond with uh, the field come. Okay. Um. You've known me long enough to know that, you know, my uh, one of my favorite sayings is the ratio of something to nothing is infinite. And, um, you know, waiting for someday, you know, is um, you know, it is tough, you know, if we do have an outage. Anyway, let me well, move on. And to that point, Sven, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but the reality is, is if we have a large geographic incident, a hurricane or whatever else, we're not going to get that asset. Um, so it, it it is what it is. I think we're reassessing with the chiefs to figure out perhaps another strategy. Um, but until then, we're going to use the regional asset and myself and others have, are members of the team to make sure that at least as long as it's, you know, there isn't a geographic incident where it's a contested asset that we're able to bring it to New Canaan to accomplish the mission. Thank you. So what are you going to do if we do have another Irene another Gloria, another whatnot, and what kind of communications limitations are you gonna have between fire department, police department, emergency response, highway department, and all of the vital assets that we would need to, uh, for health and safety, as well as for restoration? That is a great question. So uh, the we would obviously stand up our emergency operations center as we would anywhere else, and that'll be at a fixed facility. Um, communications, we will primarily use our existing first responder radio infrastructure, which uh, the town refreshed about six years ago, I want to say. And then we also have access to a regional because we, we, through emergency management's budget, 
uh, contribute as part of Fairfield County to what we call UASI, the Urban Area Safety Initiative Radio System, which is a, it's on the backbone of state police. Um, so the answer is we will use Optimum Light Path, the existing public safety radio system that we have now, as well as this regional one that we are contributors and partners in to manage the incident. Uh, I think where the question becomes is, okay, if you, especially with flooding as you're seeing more prevalent now, what happens if those fiber channels get washed away, things like that? What is your ability then to communicate? And the answer is, is that with our public safety radio, we have a backup. We're able to push to a VHF backup where it's a line of sight radio and it'll keep it running. It's unfortunately been used uh, as Sven was uh, alluding to a few more times than we'd like it to the last few months through a random circumstance, uh, people cutting, doing trench work and cutting through one fiber, they just happen to find it. Um, but that said, I think it does say a lot for the fact that one or two of these satellite backhaul units is good. And it also equally says why it's incredibly important that our key sites have to have generators. Uh, and right now we have, a, we have a big gap with Lapham. We're waiting on parts for the generator. It was approved uh, and it's been, as it is, I hate to say nationally, uh, it could be months before we see that. Um, so we're, uh, we had to go out again on Sunday. I'm gonna have a conversation with uh, some folks at Public Works and others to try to come up with a plan, whether it's how do we get a generator there and how do we hook it up? We just talked with Chris Kaiser and some others. Um, so the answer to your question is if it's a statewide emergency, we're, we're, I think we're well situated. The question becomes if we lose our primary infrastructure in particular internet and power, power we're good, generation we're good, internet we're relying on fiber at the end of the day. And there is what Frontier and Optimum, those are the two providers. And we've seen that in the last year, there's obviously a vulnerability there. Thanks. What's the workaround for that? For which system, sir? Well, if you lose fiber, you lose Frontier, you lose Altus or Optimum, um, how, how much trouble or how much delay is that going to be? for any type of response? Well, I think uh, we've, we've seen and tested that our radio system is resilient uh, in the fact that the backups work. Um, I think that we we can improve in our, our, our own internal realization that the system is down and be quicker with the, the switching to the backups, but that's just a matter of training. Um, I, I think the, the answer is, is once you lose those nodes, the, there's only a couple, and, I, and again, I don't want to get too into the technical end of it because obviously I don't want to expose critical infrastructure. Um, no, I get that. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple things that, and in particular, I would encourage you to have a conversation with Chris Kaiser. He has been such a wealth of information, and my God, the man is on call 24-7 and has made miracles happen. Um, but in conversation with him, there are definitely things that need to be improved. We need to find ways to encourage our providers of, in particular, fiber to lay more fiber of those main pipes and switches, because they're doing a lot of the branch work on individual roads, but they end up coming through one main node, right? Like one or two main roads, and that's it. That's why I was saying before, we need to uh, get the information from ESME on the path of switch redundancy. Yeah. Let's just move this along a little bit quicker, and I'm gonna ask uh, Chief DeFederico, um, John, could you give us an overview of 911 dispatch, how it works in New Canaan, and uh, you know what it hooks up to? Sure, it's uh, it, it's hooked up to obviously the PD. We're called a, a public service answering point, a PSAP, and there every town has one, or every or most towns have one. Uh, if if for any reason ours go down, we forward it over to Darianne, who's our neighbor neighboring PSAP. If it's a large scale down uh, outage in, in the area and, and Darianne was out as well, we could also uh, forward it off to the state police. You can forward it to any PSAP, um, which we did recently when we moved to, to Locust Street, when we had to switch over from South Avenue location to, to Locust that day, we did have to obviously go down for a period of time, but we moved all of the equipment. So we did, uh, partner up with Darianne. Obviously that was a planned outage, but uh, nonetheless, it we tested it and it worked. Um, what we would do then is send an officer down to Darianne to help us dispatch our officers 
as needed. Um, but the 911 system accepts calls from wireless, uh, wireless providers, uh, cell phones. That, that's uh, drastically improved in the last 10 years or so with giving a location and caller identification and, and subscriber information. Um, uh, then obviously uh, landlines, home, home lines, voice over IP or wired uh, come into the 911 center and display the caller's information. And we have direct communication with, with the caller. Um, and as you alluded to uh, recently in the last couple of years, 911 system also accepts text messages. Uh, text to 911 came online a couple of years ago. Uh, we don't get a, a high usage of it, but it is something available. And you know, the concept of it is if you're in an environment, so let's say a, you know, a, a hostile situation where you're hiding in a closet or in your bedroom behind a locked door and you can't speak because an intruder's uh, down the hall or could hear you, you can text the 911. Um, so that's a great asset that we have as well that's available to the public. But that's, that's basically 911 uh, in a nutshell. Hey, Chief, just a quick question for you. How many people are aware? I was not aware of the texting to 911, which you, is. Yeah, I, I don't. We, we've put it out several times. Uh, certainly, we put it out during uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We've put it out on our social media several times. But uh, we, we, keep, we keep putting it out. And it's just one of those things that I, I, I think people maybe forget about because well, let's be honest, people don't call 911 every day and then they don't recall that this service is available, but uh, we can still continue to put it out and, and, and as a public service announcement. I think that's important. And, um, you know, I've been, uh, I think maybe some of the questions are, you know, we understand, you know, um, how we talk with uh, emergency responders, um, you know, during infrastructure issues, um, you know, we have all the SOPs are all set up and ready to roll, right? The question is, and one of my focuses is going to be between us, you know, do we need to set up a, uh, a set of uh, SOPs or, you know, uh, for residents, for homeowners, you know, that say, you know, if, if I don't have cable anymore, you know, I have to be able to get um, an antenna, a, a, you know, an antenna over the air. If I can't do that, you know, what are my options? Um, if my power is out, you know, and I have cable, but my router is dead, you know, what are my options? So that's something I want to focus on with you guys, you know, over the next, you know, couple months this spring, so that we have, you know, a real menu of, you know, here's what's going on, you know, here's what my capability is, here's what I've got left, and how do I get a 911 call in? Because maybe I thought maybe Mike's question before was less on, you know, how do you guys operate, you know, as far as once the call is received. Um, I'm looking at, you know, how does a resident operate in order to get a plea for help, you know, into 911, into the dispatch center. Yeah, and w with Russ being on board now as a dedicated emergency management director, you know, w as far as uh, focusing on emergency preparedness, that's something that people need to be aware of, or, or what are your communication capabilities, uh, not in good times, but in bad times, and what redundancies do you have in your in your home to contact loved ones or 911 emergency services, whatever the case may be, and, and that's, you know, something that we're certainly willing to help people test and, and uh, recognize what they have and what they can do and can't do. And I think most people, for the most part, know what their capabilities are with their cell service at their house, if it's good service or not. And the people that are in bad areas certainly know where they are. And, you know, if, if their landline went down and they don't have good cell service at their house, they're, they're kind of in a, in a predicament that they need to be able to 
get to an area where they do have cell service if they can. And that's, that's, that's part of the problem with limited cell service. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think that the yeah, I would like to just follow up on that a little bit because your willingness to, to help people figure out what they have. I'm, I'm one of those people. Um, and I know several others because I mean, my neighborhood's one of those, but you know, once I don't have power, I have nothing. I have no cell. I have no, I have no way of contacting anybody. Um, and there's just nothing I can do about that. I, I'm, um, and um, case in point, this last storm, just last this week, my power went out in the middle of the night. Fine. Um, but I can't, I have no cell. I have no nothing. My alarms are going off. It was restored, ever so by it. But then I got the text in the morning and I didn't realize that there actually was a live wire down right in front of my house. They were telling me it was live and not to touch it, but I didn't get those texts because I don't get any cell service here. Um, I also have a neighbor who, you know, was up on Ponus Bridge who saw a transformer hit by lightning. The power was gone, couldn't call anything. He was watching it burn, trying to call the fire department. Somebody else obviously saw it and was able to get through and did, it got there. But um, there's a just, I guess, real issues to the extent you have other options or ways that we can start to talk to people about what to do, because my concern is that at some point, one of these are gonna matter. Agreed, and 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 the reality is, is that, you know, obviously the world has come a long way from the old, and spent a laugh, the old call boxes where you, if there was a fire, you went to the firehouse and pulled the, the box yeah. from the firehouse. Uh, but that said, it is, there are absolutely parts of town, uh, especially in the north side, the west side, where you don't have that ability to, to activate 911. Uh, and I think our residents have an expectation that they should be able to do that at the drop of a hat as they should. Um, and if you have that cacophony of circumstances where you have a power outage, or sometimes you may have power and you know the way that Optima and all these things work with their switches, it could be a power outage between you and wherever the next optimum stop is, uh, that it turns off the internet at your house, but you have power, you've lost voice over IP on your phone. And we've yeah. gone from the copper telephone, the plain old telephone systems to voice over IP phones. And a lot of people to Spence point, this is public education, that they need to understand that if you don't have power and you have voice over IP, you're probably not gonna be able to use your phone at all. They'll find out. And that means try your cell phone. And if that doesn't work, Unfortunately, the answer right now is you could try to text because it's a much smaller uh, mm -hmm. piece of data. Uh, and then the next step is get in a car. And and I hate to say it, unlike the people, uh, I think it was on Bob Hill Lane or Evergreen mm -hmm. where we had the fire, where it was, they got in a car and started driving until they could find a cell phone to notify fire for us. And this, is, this is the issue. Like if I had done that, I wouldn't have seen, there's no lights. I wouldn't have seen the wire yeah. that was live in my street that they texted me not to don't here, which was great that they could do it. So, um, so yeah, there's no, and there's no landlines anymore. I would get one, but you don't get, <laughs> right. you can't get a landline anymore. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. not, it's not realistic to tell people everybody should get a Starlink or everybody should have Starlink. <laughs> we're not there yet. Eventually right. I'm sure we will, but we're not. And that's, I think why the chiefs and I have, and others have been advocating that comprehensive cell service is important. Otherwise there aren't, I mean, technologically open, easily available, communications, there aren't many other options. I mean, text for 911 is a huge win in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. But it doesn't solve the fundamental problem if you're in a valley and you have no service and your power's out, there, you just don't have communications. Right, and I'm not confident, I mean, personally, that Starlink would work all that much better here where I- uh, In the know, summer, but... I'll, and to the point, in the summer <laughs> when I was testing it, when there are leaves on the trees, it integrated mm -hmm. its performance. And we have a very thorough canopy here. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that, um, that I'm starting to bug uh, Russ with is, um, uh, you know, I do a lot of backcountry hiking and there's uh, two systems out there. One is called Motorola DeFi and the other one is called Zolio, which allow you to purchase a, a satellite link machine um, that Bluetooths into your uh, cell phone. It has its own battery, so you can uh, you can text out. So the question is, can I text out to nine one one with that? And uh, these are some things you know to investigate. Uh, the Zolio costs about two hundred bucks, <clears throat> and a, a DeFi costs about one hundred and fifty, and both include one year. So we're just 
trying to think about, you know, um, and they, they both run on the Iridium satellite links. So we're trying to figure out, you know, maybe if those work or not. And, and I'd add to speak for the chief, but, you know, we work with um, Clayton North Graves and the guys who run Iowa on for the state. If we let them know we want to test something, they will have no issue with us saying, hey, we're going to test this system. Let's see where it ends up. Because, you know, with, with satellite, it may end up not in our piece app, it may be in another town. But as long as we work with them beforehand, let's test it out. Let's find out. Yeah, I don't want to be sitting out with you up in Wavy Park for us, you know, trying to thing out and then, um, you know, have the, uh, you know, have the uh, FCC cops show up. Understood. Now, I think between uh, our, our management team here, we've got the appropriate connections to let them know it's coming and to test it out the appropriate way, sir. All right. Once more around on uh, emergency 911, um, the focus, my focus will remain on, you know, um, how to uh, put together a list of options for residents who need to make a 911 call when various pieces of the infrastructure are down. Um, you know, some people have generators, some people may have a UPS that may be enough to get through. Uh, we have uh, fiber Wi Fi, unless that's in the street, we have cell phone over the air which may not be available. Um, we have satellite, which may be expensive, maybe not, may not be expensive. And we have probably still a bunch of folks around town have still got a uh, copper line. So we'll see what we can do and uh, put that together. And the education on the text of 911 will also. The education on the text of 911, yes. I'm gonna assume I made it to say the same side of the assumption, but, um, you know, we thought like you know, for people to know that, and, and I was thinking about this, the idea that you know, they don't follow the lockdown I, procedures they do at school. I'm assuming that that's communicated to the kids because there's a place where that can be a real issue, and mm -hmm. that's where you know that's a you know that issue could that situ situation come anywhere, but certainly in school situations that kids would maybe just do that automatically because that's primarily how they communicate. But maybe I'm assuming that that's part of lockdown procedures. I do not know that. I'll probably ask my kids that. Chief, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, like I said, we've, we've put out public awareness and we've put out this information through uh, various channels. Obviously, a, a key component of, of the uh, reason behind Tech Night to 911 was uh, school crisis situations. So we do focus on that, but uh, hopefully they got the message. But again, like I said, you know, people seem to and not paying any attention to it when they see it because you know them the, the thought of calling 911 especially with teenagers and kids you know they, they think they're invincible probably never have to do it but uh, hopefully they'll uh, put it in their phone or something and, and just have it as a, a contact or or something but uh, we'll continue to put that message out thank you sir um anything else from you Bernie, anything? Sorry, no, very helpful. Very, very helpful. Mike? I just think it, it the conversation that we just had underscores the, the, as we need to have, obviously, and we know this better cell service in town for numerous reasons. Number one, safety, health, emergency response. Um, you know, private conversations when a situation happens with the police department or the fire department or the or the or the ambulatory service where they can't pass along information over a radio because of the fact of you got HIPAA and all these other things going on or investigations. I just think that that needs to be stressed because, as Jill said, you know, one situation is really going to highlight that. And do you really want to have that situation before people get the message? that cell service and increased services is, is, is more important for health and safety, as well as the protection of the citizens. Thank you, Mike. Joe? Nope, I think I echo Mike's uh, concerns, but that's all I've got. Then I think I'll say, uh, Chief to Frederico. Director Kimes, thank you very much for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. It's been um, educational and um, 
thought and uh, action stimulating. Well, thank you. And thank you for your work in particular with regards to resiliency, uh, because that has been an area of focus, whether it's power or internet of emergency management for a while. Um, so anything you can do and anything I can do to partner with you to improve that, tremendously appreciated. Well, we were promised uh, um, an overview without uh, um, compromising any security issues on uh, path and switch redundancy and I'm gonna hang on to that like a terrier. I'd also like to chime in as far as the, the need for cell service. And I know it's a contentious issue, but uh, we as first responders also rely on cell service at scenes. We, we oftentimes, especially in on the police side of things, we need to communicate back and forth at a scene, uh, whether it's call for additional resources, have some communications that we don't wanna put up over, over, the, uh, over the air or for conserving traffic, radio traffic, we can't uh, communicate everything over the, the, our, our two-way radios. Uh, so we rely on, on cell service at a crime scene or at a fire or at a scene where we need to deliver sensitive information to and from our, our partners. Um, so it's, it's important for us as well to, to have viable cell service throughout town. We rely on that for our mobile data terminals, our, our in-car computers, uh, various things uh, that, we, that we rely on. So it's, it's very important for us as well on our, 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 the working side of us as well. I will agree with that. Um, you know, in incidental conversations with your uh, patrol force, um, those points were uh, driven home very, very strongly. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome, thank you. Okay. Close under uh, item six on emergency communications. Um, utility commissioner reports. Um, I'm going to start with Hiram because he's sitting right here next to me. Uh, just a couple of areas, and I won't take up too much time. Um, in our November meeting, we had a representative from the city's water company uh, come and talk to us about some general issues. And at the end, we asked him a few questions. And then after we left, I think we talked a few more. I mentioned that I would try, I would follow up. And uh, in the interim, I, I, was, I did have a chance to think through, it really goes to water supply and, and, and water quality. Mm -hmm. And I was able to go through the, the regulatory filing, which wasn't that long ago. Uh, it took, I, I looked at the state regulatory, this was actually not that easy to find. Um, and to find the exhibits that actually had sort of new payment systems and, and their margin of safety, which is sort of their, their measure of, 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 of their estimate of availability, which is a little old, but nonetheless, we found that and our, the demand usage for, you know, some of the information. And I think that, um, so I, I, I sent out some questions off to, uh, the board was the same. I, I've not gotten a response back, but um, and that was just only a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't had a chance to follow up. But I think that the information that they file, um, you know, on the supply, on the quality checks that they do, you know, for the payment. Now this, we know from that, because conversation only covers a less than half of the city residents. But nonetheless, that's, that's the utility that's part of our, our, our area. And so that's, that's one area where I think we can get clarification on their estimation of our margin of, of, of safety, or our extra margin of water they have available for the interconnection system that they have. So obviously they get water from very defined areas that serve us. And the margin is not as high as one might think, but they have estimates that it's fine. And they also have obviously have resources that if it, when it gets to, when it changes, where they can, how they can expand. But I think we can ask and, and, and get more direct answers on, you know, when, when was this estimation paid? What was the assumption? How does that compare to recent usage, which I found was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, get some explanation of the changes of the prior installation, the demand commitment for the payment, and kind of what's very and why, what they think, how that aligns with their forecast, which was a few years ago. And if this were to suddenly change, both in supply and demand, well, you know, what's their next, where are they going to get that next resource from? And just to get a, a safe understanding for supply, to make sure that they feel, we all feel fine about the water supply. Now this is again, 
only for that those residents that are served by the water system. Okay. At the same time, there, you know, we also spoke about you know that the private well and the aquifer that that that, that and the groundwater that supplies the other residents in their own well. That there really is no oversight of that. It is really each resident on their own, and the water evaluation is a little on their own. And um, I did find through the the Mark on these website, Brandon website, what you do if you have a problem with your supply or that you can't treat your water. It is fair, pretty well spelled out. This is what you do, okay. and this is how it goes about. Um, I did speak with our city planner on our next topic um, briefly, and one of the subjects asked, like, has that really occurred to you? And in terms of like a neighborhood just having an issue and needing to get capital expenditures to, you know. To, to meet a neighborhood or a house, whatever. And it's like not in that, that she wasn't aware of it. There was maybe something in the 90s, primarily probably wastewater related, which is a different, slightly different system. Yeah, for sure. yeah. so, so um, but I think, you know, and laying out some of these facts, I started to put this together, just, this is just facts mm -hmm. that we can just lay out and, and adapt. But between the supply for this, as well as what a citizen does who's on a private well, this is what you do because I think it's a little bit unclear if a neighborhood has a problem, how likely is that problem, or maybe it's highly unlikely, but nonetheless, it's not hard to figure out that if that were to occur, this is what you would do. This is how long it takes. This is what your options would be in the interim. And if it's an area in which, you know, I don't know, is that, it's, it's prohibitively expensive, and, and then that's up to the city, like, What's this, you know, what exactly the city's role? It was very clear it's not utilities responsibility until the state would mandate that it's not part of the franchise as far as I understood. Right. So there's a dynamic that there's a gray area that um, it's not clear that it's laid out. Maybe it's not necessary, but I think it's it's clear at least to lay out some of these issues that this is what occurred and, and what would the city do, what would the residents do if something happened? If there was an interruption or a quality that couldn't be easily treated, I'm going to try to figure out just by talking to some of the private well services how likely that is. Okay. Just because I, you know, I, I don't know that answer, but it, to me that strikes me. You know, going to the resiliency aspect, it's just like where are you know? I think all these surveys that we're doing of the different services, we're finding out where could there possibly be an issue, and I think that's part of what we can do is at least try to identify it, see how unlikely it is, and then the city and the Various representatives can make a determination on how much they want to plan for that pinhole risk, whether it's too small or it's likely or it's too devastation. How far do you want to go forward? But those are the those are some of the follow-up thoughts and some of the information that I provide. I, in the next month or so, I think I'll be able to put some stuff on paper that we can present as factual to figure out the right way we're supposed to aggregate some of these facts and, and sort of keep it as a working document on some of these issues. Okay. You said there was something else? Yeah, and it's just, it's just uh, really, real quickly, um, in relation to the DOCE process right. that's going through, I, I spoke to, to Sarah Carey, and I, obviously that issue is, you know, they're going through the customer, the rich, which I'll talk to you about later, you know, trying to figure out how we, how we can interact with that. And they're, you know, they're getting customer feedback on, 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 on citizen feedback about what's important, clearly touching on the, all the issues that we're, 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 Exploring totally. and uh, I just I spoke to Sarah Carey, the, the city planner, just on about whether the EV stations, underground water, the water issues that we talked about, mm -hmm. and because those are the issues that are coming up. If you read through the report, that's what citizens I think are sort of wanting or asking about. And I asked her, like, well, these are areas which I think we could be as a commission helpful on, and wanted to make sure that we are. We not overlapping or not doing work that's already been done or, you know, just whatever. And what I got from her was that uh, it's not, it would be useful because the plan will be finalized in the spring, summer. And that's really sort of outlining what our desires and goals, but then there's the bridge to facts and action plan that goes, you know, that the city leaders will evaluate. That. So okay. it's like saying, well, the citizens want this, right? Well, what does that mean? How much does it cost? How, how do we finish? So I think that's where we can 
play a role. And she said that there would be a February or March discussion where uh, a representative of our commission may want to participate or be part of it, or listen, or they were going to work that out. Yeah. Just, just on these issues, at a pretty high level, but just to figure out, because it sounds like it's really sort of the bridge from the output of that plan to an action plan. Okay. What did they say about the replacement of old infrastructure in town? I think it's, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's certainly an issue about at this, at this point, it's just about the importance of, it's importance of resiliency, it's importance of, you know, un, you know, they go to the underground, it's like, nobody really knows how much the general public is not aware of the cost. And so we, you know, we've spoken about that in the past and right. being able to maybe kind of get a number, get some estimations, and then people can figure out whether how much can be done or how expensive it is. And mm -hmm. then that value proposition can be made. Again, that's what. But I'm talking about the water company taking responsibility for replacing hundred year old mains. Are they taking, are they taking responsibility for replacing main street mains that are over a hundred years old or what's, what's the status on that? Yeah, no, that I don't know. I don't know. Did, did we get any response to that the last meeting? From Aquarian? No. Yeah. No. no, other than they they have their they have their capital plan that they're following to, you know, that they're that they're moving forward, you know, on, on their views of, of what they what they believe is important to the infrastructure. And do they do they do we have the locations in, in town? Yes. Yeah. They they did I mean they did make a, a decent presentation, you know. They did say that, you know, we are you know, replacing mains. Yeah. And, you know, the forward looking on that was, yeah, it, was, I mean, it wasn't good. But I mean, you know, if you look backward um, at the stuff that they have replaced, um, it, it seems like they're making a, <clears throat> a reasonable capital investment in the infrastructure. Right. So, I mean, there's, I mean, they've been on page 26 of that presentation, there's the outline of, of, of current and past projects. Um, one of the things I wanted to get to, I, mean, I don't think we got to the details of what, what's sort of the next one. What, what's what's the, the next? What are the next, the next big plans, just, just so that we know it and uh, we get a sense of it. Uh, you know, there's stuff like, you know, Kelly Green and stuff like that, which was you know, yeah. way underrated. A lot, of, a lot of the old houses were torn down and huge McMansions put up. So there's, yeah. a, lot, there's a lot of work there. Um, so anyway. You know, we've been watching, um, you know, I guess the 36 inch main is going to be uh, starting this spring. I see the paints on the road on South Avenue starts, uh, the paint starts at the uh, at uh, Orchard and, you know, proceeds down toward the, uh, down toward Farm Road. So that uh, huge project is going to go in. Mike, did you have anything else tonight? I did. I have the gas utility, Eversource Gas, coming in for the February meeting just to give an update in regards to gas installations, what the penetration is, what uh, any future plans may or may not be, uh, and whatnot. Just a nice update conversation about that. Okay. And then we're working towards getting something substantial for um, for March um, to have uh, to have the Eversource Electric come in and and maybe give us some updates and information. Okay. I think for the Eversource, that's one way we can get it. Yeah, I think ahead, ahead of time, make sure that we're, because it's going to be the same resilience and where there's sensitive points. And I know that's a big focus, and I guess want to make sure that that they're aware that that's going to be the question, so that yeah. they come prepared to. Yeah, no, that's why that's why we have to have the right person come in, and that's why it's taking a little bit more time, yeah. and uh, and so we we have to be patient. Yeah. And we're going to come in as a friendly as a as a friendly source. I mean, they have invested a lot of money in over two years in upgrading the underground system in, in the downtown area uh, and are 
trying to produce some information for us going forward. So uh, as much as the wind blows and the trees fall and the lines come down, um, unless you have no trees or you have nothing else, it's, it's really being there and, and being one of the people responsible for restoration in the past. It's not an easy thing and, and it doesn't get fixed quickly. Anything else, Mike? No, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Jill, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Bernie? I'm good for tonight also. Thank you. I'm all done. I'll accept a motion to adjourn at 8.35. Second. Okay. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That was Mike. That was Mike who second, right? Ah, uh, yes, Mike was second. Okay, just so that you know, Bob gets it down so that we're all set. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> My motion. Oh, okay. Okay. Arm can't do. Okay, folks. Thanks a bunch, and um, I don't know. Uh, appreciate your help tonight. And um, next month we'll be back with the uh, with the Boston charge. Dad will be back. <laughs> 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 no. From down Not under. <laughs>